is uh, CurlysvilleFirst.com slash donate. You can set it up however you would like to uh, on there as well. This morning, uh, we, are, this is the, uh, we are concluding uh, Ecclesiastes, and which is kind of funny because one of the main uh, verses that we're going to focus on where he talks about the conclusion of the whole matter. His whole entire time that he's been going through all these things, because we see this over and over again, obviously, in Ecclesiastes is... You know, vanity of vanities, everything is, van- everything is vanity, everything is meaningless. And so we go on there, but we see, uh, obviously, about halfway through, he starts to change that, you know, and shift everything and saying, you know what, this is what really matters. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. As I said before, you have Psalms, Proverbs, there's Ecclesiastes. If you go, uh, you know, uh, into Isaiah and all those other, you know, books afterwards, you've gone too far. But that's where we're at is Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Let's look at verse 1. It says, Remember now the, uh, thy creator in the days of thy youth, uh, while the, uh, the evil days come, uh, come not, nor the years draw, uh, draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. When the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain, in the day, uh, in the day when the keepers of the house Shall, uh, shall tremble, and the strong men shall uh, bow themselves, and the grinders cease because uh, they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened. And the doors uh, shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall uh, rise up at, at the voice of the bird, and, and all the, the daughters of music shall be brought low. Verse 5, and when, uh, and when they... And when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way, and the almond trees uh, and the almond trees shall flourish, and the grasshopper uh, shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth uh, goeth uh, to all uh, to his long home, and uh, the mourners go about the streets, or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or uh, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel uh, broken at the cistern, then uh, shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he, uh, he uh, still uh, taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and, and set in order many proverbs the preacher uh, sought out uh, to find out, uh, find out acceptable words, and that which was uh, written was upright and even words of truth. The words of the wise are as uh, goads and nails, and uh, for, and fastened by uh, fastened by the the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, may, uh, my son, be uh, admonished of making many books. There is no end. And much study is a weariness of flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret, uh, every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word this morning. God, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit. God, that I, that I would preach uh, your truth. And not, my, uh, and not my own thoughts. But, Lord, that you would speak through me, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear. God, may your word fall, uh, uh, may your word fall upon fertile soil. In Jesus' name, amen. As we have you know, seen this you know, throughout, you know, we've been going through, and like it says, vanity of vanity, he's been going through all those different things. We see a few things, obviously, in this, in this portion. And I'm not, I don't really want to uh, go over things that we've already gone over. I don't want to you know, uh, keep going over the same thing because you know, that, you know, can, after a while you just say, well, you know, I've heard that. But you know, there's a, a few things in there. There's a reason. He explains the reason for a preacher in the church in this, in this chapter. What is, you know, what is the reason for you know, having a pastor in the church? Well, in verse 9 it says, And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave uh, good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought uh, to uh, find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright and even the words of truth. And so what we see in here, the preacher is supposed to do is, is what? Is bring knowledge to the people. 
The pastor is supposed to bring knowledge to the people. If the pastor is preaching what he wants to preach or preaching you know, his opinions or anything else, he's not bringing knowledge. He's bringing folly. He's bringing his opinion. But the words of truth and the words of the wise are coming from the word of God. That's where we need to hear them. We can go out there and hear all the motivational speakers we want, and it's going to do nothing for us but send us to hell because you know why? We're still, you know, we're still apart from Christ. But when we go to church and there's a, a pastor or a preacher there that is preaching the truth, what is it going to do? It's going to bring about knowledge. It's going to bring about wisdom. And most of all, when they hear the words of God, you know, if you're not saved, hopefully you, you believe on the Lord and you get eternal life. Amen? But the, the whole thing is the main uh, uh, purposes, you know, the main you know, uh, scriptures I want to focus in on this morning is 13 and 14 which is, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret, uh, secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And obviously, you know, the, you know uh, we could sit there and say, well, yeah, naturally you're going to go there, but there's a problem in, in modern Christianity today. We don't understand the word fear. We don't understand. And so this morning, the title of my sermon is Fear God. And they say, well, I shouldn't fear God because, you know, God's a loving God and, you know, I should never fear him. Well, the Bible tells us to fear God. So if we don't fear God, we're not listening to what the Bible says. And so the conclusion for King Solomon is this, what? Fear God and keep his commandments, right? That's his whole thing. After he wrote, you know, 11 chapters, you know, nearly, well, you know, even 12 chapters, the last two verses, he comes and says, you know what? Here's the whole thing. I told you all these things are vanity. I told you everything in life is meaningless, but I want to leave you with this one good thing. Fear God and keep his commandments. And so what is the fear of God? What is, what is the fear of God for the believer and for the non-believer? And what are these commandments? And are we required to keep all of them in order to not lose our salvation or to keep our salvation? Well, fear, you know, Webster's Dictionary defines fear as this. Fear is the passion of our nature, which excites us to provide for our security on the uh, approach of evil. When there are times in our life where we, you know, we see a coming evil, what happens? Fear rises up in us, and it causes us to do you know, several things. Fear can drive somebody to do something heroic. When we've seen you know, uh, in different areas where there's been you know, a mass shooting, and a, a citizen, a law-abiding citizen comes along and takes care of that mass shooter... I can guarantee he wasn't saying, well, I'm going to be courageous today and go ahead and do it. Fear drove him to go do what? Protect. But fear can also uh, do the opposite. It can also you know, paralyze us where we just sit there and we just do nothing. We're so taken by fear, it almost takes somebody like coming up and slapping us, basically, in order, to get, uh, in order for us to get out of that. I recently just had something like that you know, happen when we went um, you know, for, for Alicia's birthday. We went to the Smoky Mountains, and there's a, a place called you know, Ober, Auber Mountain that we went to. And I hadn't had a fear that I had, uh, you know, that I, I, a fear came over me that I hadn't had since I was a kid. And I never had experienced it. I always had it in my mind that I was going to be afraid whenever this would happen. And that is, I grew up in, you know, uh, near us, probably about 20, uh, about, sorry, about 30, 45 minutes away from us in Wisconsin. You say, well, Wisconsin is flat for skiing, but we went skiing. Because why? Because they you know, built a big mountain out of dirt, and then they put you know, stuff on it and everything else. So we were over there, and we, we would ski, and I would, have, you know, I would have a little bit of fear going up the ski lift, a little bit. But I would sit there most of the time talking to my dad and everything else, and there was one time when I was a kid that the chair was icy. And I got on there, and I was you know, with my dad and my mom. I was sitting in the middle, and all of a sudden that, you know, that chair was a little you know, slippery, and I was up on the you know, ski lift, and I started sliding off. My dad caught me. And so I had that, you know, a little bit of fear, but the fear wasn't necessarily falling off, you know, fear wasn't fa uh, falling off going up. The fear was for me falling off when I was going down the chairlift, in which I never went down a ski lift. I never went down one. I always went up one until Auburn Mountain came about. My wife, who is terrified of a lot of things, she says, I wanted to see the top of this mountain. So did my daughter. They said, do you want to go? And I said, oh, not, no, not really. And she kept on pushing. I said, you know what? It's her birthday. I'm going to go do it all the way up. I'm fine. Occasionally thinking about the fact i got to come back down. In my mind, I'm going, if they allow me, I'll walk down the mountain. Because in my mind, that's the best way to go. I don't care if the chairlift will get me down faster. 
Going down the mountain, walking down, it's faster for me than it is going down that chairlift. Well, we got all the way up. It was stinking cold. We waited until like the last part of the week. It got colder as the week went on. And all of a sudden, they're like, okay, well, it's time for you to go down. You know, and, they, and they said, well, get back on the chairlift. And they would not let you walk down the mountain. <laughs> and so my daughter is on there with me. And I get on there, and I don't have any problem. I've been on many chairlifts, sitting down and all that. And I go, and all of a sudden, that fear just overtakes. I'm just sitting there. And my daughter knows. And the reason why she knows is because I'm squeezing her shoulder without knowing it. I'm over there just like with my arm around her, you know, protecting her. And going like this, and I'm like just, and she probably had like fingerprint marks in her shoulder after I was done. I was just like this, and she's like, Dad, you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. Why, why, why do you ask? And she's like, uh, uh, you know, I was like, oh, no reason. And I was like, oh, wait, I'm squeezing your shoulder. Sorry. And I kept doing it, like, without knowing it. I had this, like, whole thing. And, you know, obviously, I made it. I survived the whole thing. But for some reason, I always had that fear. I never understood why I had that fear. And maybe it was because of that one time, you know, uh, with the ice on the ski lift that I was afraid of falling off. But it, was, it happened while I was going up. I never had been down. But I told myself that I was going to be really afraid if that ever happened. And so in my mind, I'm going, this, and there was no ice whatsoever because this was in October. There's no snow or anything else. They were blowing snow there, but there was no snow on the ski lift. But we have those times you know, in our life where we sit there, and there's those, like I say, fear can move us to be heroic and courageous, or fear can paralyze us where we're sitting on a ski lift squeezing our daughter's arm, and she's probably got bruises you know, from the fact that we're squeezing her arm because, or her shoulder because of the fact that I'm so uh, petrified by something that was not really worth getting afraid of in the first place, right? You say, no, no, that's not right. No, I'd still be afraid. But the thing is, is that, you know, through that whole thing, I was so glad. I guarantee that if I went to the doctor, my blood pressure would have been through the roof. Because it was, even though that I kept on telling, and I had to tell myself, and I tell this to my daughter, because there's times where she gets afraid, and I tell her, I said, you know what, you just got to tell yourself, you know, it's okay, you're going to be fine, everything is all right. It's good for me to tell her that, but when it came to me, I had to sit there and I kept on telling myself because I, didn't, I wanted to hold on to that, almost like I wanted to hold on to the fear. But after I told myself, it's okay, it's all right, I'm going to be all right, everything's good, everything's fine, everything, and everything after that was fine. Now, my wife, she was having a blast behind us. She was enjoying it. She was like, I, am so, she was, I was terrified, but I loved it, you know, going down that. And I was like, yeah, I don't think I really want to go up on a ski, you know, go down a ski lift ever again. You know, with that. But like I said, there's a healthy fear and there's a misplaced fear. Was there a reason for me to be, you know, scared? No. There wasn't a fear. It was a misplaced fear. You know, the thing is, 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 you know, it's like a situation if you ever run into a bear. What's the worst thing that you can do with a bear? Scream and run away. But what do people do? Scream and run away. And they get attacked. And they're like, I wonder why they got attacked by the bear. No, you just calmly, slowly back up. And that's just, you know, one of those things that we need to realize is that there's a lot of times that we, we see these things and we need to realize that, yes, there is a healthy fear and there's a misplaced fear. A bear will kill you. All right? A ski lift going down, more, you know, 99.999% of the time, it's not going to kill you. Right? I only say that because, you know what, there's only one person we can trust in, and that's Jesus Christ. It's only, the only thing that we could trust on 100% of the time. Amen? But there are many times in the Old Testament where there are, synonym, you know, there are synonyms for fear. But the main ones for fear are fear, terror, reverence, awe, and dread. With the most, most of the time it says the fear of the Lord or the fear of God. And so you sit there and you say, you know what, Pastor? That seems like the exact opposite. Like there's ones in there that seems like the exact opposite of what's happening. You know, fear, terror, reverence, awe. Those don't sound like they go together, do they? But the Bible talks about them, and obviously we need to realize that context plays a huge part in what they're talking about. Because we can read about fear in one case and be all like, oh, okay, that's a, that's a good, healthy fear. In another case, it's not. And so what we need to realize is that, um, that when we come across the word, you know, the fear of God or the fear of the Lord, that there is context does play a huge part in it. A Webster's Dictionary also puts it this way. It says, in good men, the fear of God is a holy awe or reverence of God and, ha- uh, and his laws which spring from a just view 
and, uh, and love of the divine character, leading uh, the character of it to hate and to shun everything that can offend uh, such a holy being, and inclining them uh, to aim at perfect obedience. So what is it saying here? Basically, you, f- you fear God. Why? Because you love him. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. I shouldn't fear you know, somebody that I love. Yes, you do. If you have parents, you have fear. And, it's a, and it should be a healthy fear. Your kids shouldn't be terrified of you, but there should be a fear of the fact that, for one thing, they love you because, hey, you're, you know, you're, uh, uh, you're their, uh, your parents, but also the fact is, is that if you do something that they don't ask you to do, and over and over again they ask you not to do it, there might be a fear that you're going to have, there might be a terror that comes over you all of a sudden because, you know what, mom or dad might come over and give you a spanking, right? So there should be that fear that we have. And we see, first thing I want to talk about is the fear of God in the believer. The fear of God in the believer. Joseph is the first one I want to look at. He was, you know, oftentimes we'll look at Joseph as, you know, later on in life when he's the second in command. That he's done his whole thing. Joseph is the second in command. He has this healthy fear of God and everything else. And say, oh, that's awesome. That's amazing. Well, in Genesis chapter 42, verse 18, it says this. It says, and Joseph said unto them the third day, this do and live for I fear God. So we know that Joseph feared God. But what we don't realize, you know, a lot of times is we want to look at the end result. We go, wow, man, that's awesome that he was second in command. He's like the vice president. You know, he's, he's out there, God, you know, um, Pharaoh is trusting him with all this whole thing. But we, we don't want to remember what happened to get him there, which is he was cast into a pit and left for dead by his brothers. Right? They threw him in a pit, hoping that he would just eventually die. They took his, his coat of many colors, dipped it in blood, and brought it back to their dead and said, um, we're sorry, but Joseph is dead. These are loving brothers, right? I mean, you just sit there and you think about it. And then, you know, on, you know because you know the reason why this happened? is because the, he told them a dream that he had. Makes you, you know, or, you know, think about those times where you had those, you know, bad tacos and all of a sudden you wake up in the middle of the night, you have these bad dreams. You're like, I don't think I want to be telling people about my bad dream. Well, these are, the reason why these dreams were bad is because Joseph tells a story which basically says that he sees his brothers and his father bowing down to him later on in life. They don't like that. They're like, how dare you say that? And they want to kill him. They throw him in a pit and, you know, they sold him to slavery and all, you know, uh, he sold him to slavery. He's thrown into jail. All this time, he's a man who fears God. And you say, well, you know, I thought that this was you know, going to be a good story. It is at the end, but nobody wants to talk about the middle. Nobody else wants to, nobody wants to talk about the fact of what happened. He was falsely accused. He was lied about, right? He was left in jail for years and forgotten about, but he remained faithful and trusted God. That's why he got put in second command. It's because through everything that he went you know, through in his life, he remained faithful, and he remained, uh, and he remained to trust God no matter what. Then he became uh, the second in charge, and what ends up happening, his dream came true, which was his brothers bowed themselves before him and their father. Why? Because there was a great famine that happened, and, he was, and all that time, he could have sat there and said, yeah, that's right, you better bow down to me. You did all this to me, and look where I'm at now, look where you're at. He could have had that attitude, but he didn't. He told him to stand up, and he said, you know what? It's your brother who you thought was dead, but it is alive, right? Next person is Noah in preparing the ark. Think about this. Before Noah you know, uh, started talking about rain and everything else coming and a great big flood and everything else, there was no rain upon the earth. You say, well, that, that's impossible. We know what rain is. We're having it this morning. No, there was no rain. Why? Because the Bible says that from the midst of the ground, that's how he uh, watered the plants and he kept everything. It was like a giant greenhouse, basically, up until that point. So the people at this time were sitting there making fun of him. And he didn't build this ark overnight. It took him, uh, you know, they believe about 75 years to do this. So he had about 75 years of ridicule going on when this all happens. And so... He's talking about something that never happened, and then out of nowhere, you know, what happens? There's a small cloud that comes, and it gets bigger, and it gets bigger, and it gets bigger, right? Hebrews 11.7 says this, By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of the things not, yet, uh, not seen as yet. Why? Because there hadn't rained yet. He's talking about something that has never happened before. 
It says, moved with fear. What? The fear of God, right? Prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah did something in the 75 years of being ridiculed and everything else by everybody saying, you know, you know probably Noah's gone nuts. Well, he's been on this giant boat for no reason. You know, he's going to put all these... And then, you know what? What ends up happening? Everything that God told him, because he, he feared God, he trusted him, right? He had that reverence. What ends up happening? What God said would happen. Next is Abraham. A- Abraham is known for a lot of things, but remember, he was tested during the fact of him... Offering up his son as a sacrifice. How many of us in this room would be willing to say, if God said, you know what, I want you to take your son, take your child, and put him on an altar and sacrifice him. Sacrifice doesn't mean like, oh, yes, Lord, I give him to you. No, sacrifice means he's going to kill him as an offering unto God. And yet Abraham trusts God and says, I'm going to do exactly what God wants me to do. He gets up there. And he has the, I mean, I'm not saying that it was easy on him because how many parents would sit there and say it would be easy to kill your child? It wouldn't be. Gets up there, gets ready to, you know, put his arm, you know, he's got his arm back, getting ready to do it, and an angel stops him and says, no, now we know you fear God. Now we know you fear God, and you know what? What's what's happening off in the thicket? He sees a ram that, you know, that he's able to sacrifice, that God provides a provision. Obviously, it's an illusion, you know, and also an allegory for what Jesus Christ would do for us, that, you know, being the, you know, the the pure spotless lamb that was slain. But we we see this in Genesis 22, uh, verse 12, it says, and he said, lay not uh, thine hand upon the lad, neither do uh, do thou anything, uh, anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing Thou hast not uh, withheld thy son, thine only, thy only son, from me. God said, you know what? I was looking and making sure that you were going to fear, you know, uh, fear me first and then. But God always provides, right? So these are you know, cases where we sit there and we look at over and over again. We see how God wants people to fear him. He wants his followers, his believers, to fear him. He wants them to trust in him to do these things. We look at the midwives of Egypt. They did not... Uh, they refused to take the lives of Hebrew children. In other words, provide abortions. They didn't do it because, you know what, they feared God. The Bible says in Exodus chapter uh, 1, verses 17 and 21, it says this, But the, the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but save the children, uh, uh, save the men children alive. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. And so we see out of this whole thing that because, of, uh, because they wouldn't do what, uh, what man had told them, but they feared God, what did God do? God blessed them. Phineas. Phineas, oftentimes people don't you know, realize who Phineas is. If Phineas was a man, and we're going to see here, he turns away the anger of God in a time of plague. What ends up happening is, is that all these people decide to be disobedient to God, and God begins to take them out. God begins to kill them off, and you go, man, this guy's a vengeful, uh, vengeful God, right? He goes, and because they're not doing what he asked them to do, he begins to kill them off. And Phineas, in Numbers chapter uh, 25, it says this. Phineas, the son of uh, Eleazar, the son, uh, the son of Aaron, the priest, had turned away my wrath from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the, uh, the children of Israel in my jealousy. What did he do? He prayed. He prayed that God would stop his wrath against those people. And you know what? The Bible says that he saved. Let's, let's, turn, over to, uh, let's turn over to Numbers chapter 25. Because I want you to see this. Numbers chapter 25, let's, uh, start at verse uh, 6. Wait. Yeah. Sorry, verse 6. And it says, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought them unto his brethren, a a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the uh, the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping uh, weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, uh, the priest saw it. He rose up from the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, 
Because what was happening, you know, you'll see here, is there was this, uh, they were desecrating the, the temple of God. And that's what started the plague. Okay? And so in verse 8 it says, And he went uh, after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust, uh, thrust both of them through the man of, uh, Israel, the man of Israel and the, uh, the, women, uh, sorry, the woman through the belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. This is a fun story. I, I, I want to know, is this one ever taught in children's church? Taking a javelin, piercing the guy and the woman? Probably not. But it says, in verse 9, it says, And those that died in the plague were twenty and 4,000. So 2,400 people, sorry, 24,000 people died before he did this. They were desecrating the, you know, the temple, and what does he do? He takes a javelin and, and, and basically pierces them you know, both through and prays. And you know what? What ends up happening? The plague stops. God wants us to, God wants us to have such a, a fear of him that when things are happening in our life, that we see that people are desecrating God or saying things about God, that we stand up for him. That we actually don't sit back and say, you know what, it's okay. They're probably going through a hard time right now. But no, God wants you to stand up and say, you know what, we're not going to allow this to happen. Let's look at Job. A lot of you guys know about Job because at the end of it, it says, you know what, God you know, restored all things. But remember, Job, because of the, of the testimony of the Lord, is, is tested by God. God says, you know what, look at my man. All right, well, let's just read it. Job chapter 1, verse 8, it says this, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou uh, uh, considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, and uh, and perfect and upright man, one that fears God, and issues or shuns or avoids evil? And so what we see here is the fact that, you know what, if you ever, you know, when you read Job, is that you see Job just, you know, minding his own business, Satan comes along and starts, you know, saying, you know what, basically looking for who, who he can go after. And God says, well, why don't you go after a, a perfect and upright man? Why don't you go after Job? And what ends up happening? That he does, the only thing that, you know, that Satan is not allowed to do is, is what? Is take his life. So he begins to take his kids, his livestock, his livelihood, all the things in his life. He begins to take out of there. Why? Because he's perfect and upright. Say, so I don't know if I really want to live for God, you know, 100% here, because, you know, if I live up, he might do all these same things. Well, he does this, and the thing is, is that out of this whole entire situation and circumstance, what ends up happening? He's, he's you know, uh, blessed on the other side of it, but the thing is, is that God is the one who, sa- who suggests Job. Think about that. It's not Satan coming in and saying, hey, can I, you know, can I, can I pick on this person? No, God says, you know, um, have you considered my servant uh, uh, Job? What ends up happening to, uh, let's look at this one, Adam and Eve. What ends up happening to Adam and Eve? This would be an example of those that are backslidden. What ends up happening? If you're living for God, you're living in your righteous before God, everything goes well for them, right? But it's not until they decide to turn their back on God. Uh, as I'm going to begin to tell this, you know, I'll flip over to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And as we see this is that, you know, uh, it, uh, Adam and Eve never knew sin, nothing else. Everything was perfect. Everything was fine. Everything was great until the serpent comes along and tempts Eve, right? She go, uh, tempts Eve. Eve go, goes ahead and eats the fruit. She then passes it on to her husband, Adam, and then things happen. So these are things that happen when you're disobedient to God. Because why? Because God said you can eat from any tree in the garden except for that one. So what's the one that they wanted to go after? That one. Okay? It's just like when you tell your kid not to do something, what do they do? They do it. Okay? And so they go over and they, uh, and they mess with this tree and everything else. And what ends up, causing the, what ends up happening to them? is the fact that, that all of a sudden they realize that, you know, that they're naked, which they didn't realize that before. Sin enters the world. Everything all, all seems to go bad. And we have this entire situation and circumstance. And what ends up happening is the fact that God comes in there and says, well, who told you that you're naked? Who told you? And then what does he do? He kicks them out of Eden, uh, out of Eden right? You say, well, Pastor, what does this have to do with you know, a backsliding Christian? Hebrews chapter 12, verse, verses 6 through 8. It says this, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, 
and scourgeth every, uh, every son whom he receiveth. If he uh, endured chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For, uh, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be, uh, if ye be without chastisement, wherewith all are partakers, then ye, uh, are ye bastards and not sons. So what does he say? If God doesn't discipline you, you're not his child. If God is not disciplining you, if he's not chastening you, if he's not doing those things, he doesn't love you. Why? Because you're not his son. But what does he say in here? And this is what we see with Adam and Eve, that God still loves Adam and Eve, right? But he chastens, uh, he chastens, uh, he chastens them by doing what? Kicks them out of the Garden of Eden. There's always a consequence for the things that we do or don't do. They restore that relationship, yes, and they love God, but things never were the same as they once were. You don't see, you don't see them going back into the Garden of Eden. You don't see the world going back to perfect you know, as soon as they realize what they did was wrong. There's always a consequence for these things. But the Bible says that you know, for whoever he loves, he rebukes and he chastens. When you do something dumb, and you will, when you sin, I'm not saying that you should try to sin so God will just continue to love you more because that would be dumb. Because some people say, well, I'm going to sin some more so that way God loves me more. How does that work, you know, how does that work when you're a kid? If I kept on doing something dumb, I, you know, yes, I knew my dad loved me, but the thing is, is I still got whoopings every single time that I did it. God's going to chasten you when, uh, when you step out of, outside of his will. Why? Because he wants you back inside of his will. And he does that because he loves us. Let's see what the, what the fear of God does for the non-believer. Let's look over at Matthew chapter 28. We're going to look at the guards at Jesus' tomb. Verses 2 through 4 says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone of the door, uh, from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment uh, white as snow. And for, uh, and for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. They didn't die at that point, but the thing is, is that every non-believer, when Jesus you know, parts the eastern sky and comes back, is going to be the same way is that they're going to sit there and they're going to be able to they're going to sit there and shake and everything else. The only difference is, is that they will, really will die because the wrath of God will be poured out upon them. But we see uh, in here in Matthew chapter 28 is the fact that fear takes them. It's, and you want to say it's an unhealthy fear or anything else. Well, you can call it unhealthy, but the thing is, is that that's what they should be. They should be afraid because why? Because they have a, you know, an angry God that, you know, that, that is there. Look at Judas. And oftentimes people will look at, um, at uh, wait, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but let's look at Judas. Ma- uh, Matthew, uh, just flip over a chapter into Matthew 27, verses 3 through 5, and it says this. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he, had, uh, that he was condemned, repented himself and, uh, and brought again, or, yeah, brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and, uh, and elders, saying, I have sinned. In that I have betrayed innocent blood, and they said, "What is uh, what is that to us? See the, uh, thou to that." And he cast the, the pieces of silver into the temple and, uh, and departed, and went and hung himself. So you have people that will sit there and do things and, and be sorry about what they do, but the thing is, is that they never actually, they never you know give their life to the Lord, because there are people out there who say, "Well, Judas was saved, but then he lost his salvation." No, he didn't. Because he, the Bible says that he was evil from the beginning. So how could he be saved at one point when he's evil from the beginning and he just continues on you know, to what he's doing? And I'm going to get into your, you know, well, I'll, I'll wait until I get there. But the thing is that what we see in here is the fact that because he was not saved, what did he end up doing? He, uh, he went back, threw the stuff back in there, and then he went out and he basically he hung himself. And we're going to see... All this stuff, you know, is as far as the fear of God for the non-believer. The last one, as far as an example for a non-believer, is Pharaoh. Pharaoh had multiple, multiple times. He had, I believe, seven times where God told him to let his people go. That you know, and all the all the times in order to get saved. And what ends up happening? Pharaoh hardens his heart seven times, and then finally God says, "You know what? 
You want to harden your heart? I'm going to give you what you want, and I'm going to harden it for you. So when finally, it all comes down to it, what ends up happening to Pharaoh? He goes out there, he, goes, he starts chasing after him as they're parting through the Red Sea, right? Goes through there, all the, you know, all the Israelites make it through, and they don't. And he's taken out. Why? Because he would not do what God would ask him to do in his obedience. For, uh, uh, for one thing, it's the fact that, that he wasn't saved in the first place. But God was giving him those chances. He kept on telling him, do this, do this, do this, and he wouldn't do it. I mean, how many times did, 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 did he go up to Moses, I think about seven times, you know, when Moses comes up and says, this is what's going to happen. And then he goes, okay, yes, go ahead. Let my people go. Yeah, go ahead. Take your people. And then he goes, no, I'm not going to do that. Gets mad and angry and says, no, I, I decided I don't want to. And then he starts doing all these other things. So that's why all the plagues begin to happen is because of that. We see in 1 Samuel 6, it says, Wherefore, then, do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go, and they departed? In other words, he's saying, you know what? If they would have let the people go, they would still be there. They would still be alive. But since Pharaoh said no, and the Egyptians said no, God, took, you know, God uh, uh, made it you know, to where he wiped out that nation. Because they didn't want to follow him. So then the question is, is that, you know, as I'm reading through all these different examples from those who have, you know, feared the Lord and those who have not feared the Lord, do you have to keep all his commandments and are, they, and are we required, I mean, to keep them all, to keep our salvation? Number one is this. We should love and want to keep his commandments and want to see his, com- uh, his commandments kept by others. We should. That should be our desire. When we see somebody going against God's word, we should not be happy about that. Number two is this. Jesus expects you to try and keep them. Number three is this. Yes, you are required to keep his commandments. They're not arbitrary. They're not optional. But here's the thing. Will we sin? Yes. So you could say, how, Pastor, how can, how can I keep, you know, how, do, how is it that I have to keep all of his commandments, but yet he knows that I'm going to sin? Because your salvation doesn't depend upon you. So in other words, you trust in the Lord, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right, for your salvation. He, he wants you to keep all of his commandments, but he knows that you can't. This is a foreshadowing of what we see in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament... Bulls and goats never provided forgiveness. That's what Hebrews says. It says the blood of bulls and goats never provided forgiveness. Because people will say, well, there's a different salvation in the Old Testament as there is in the New, Te- uh, in the New Testament. No, it's not. The Bible has always said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Believe on the Lord, you are saved. Everything else, the sacrifices are what? They are a foreshadowing of what needed to take place. They are showing the people of Israel that, you know what, that there are 613 laws, commandments, statutes that you can't keep. And that's what the Bible is getting at. He's saying, you know what, yes, I want you to do it. I want you to love the Lord. I want you to, you know, to follow me. But I know you can't without me. Why? Because he wants you to trust him. Because if you could do it on your own, if you could keep all 613 Old Testament rules and regulations, then you wouldn't need Jesus Christ. He would have never had to come to the cross. But God knew that you would need him, so he said, you know what? I'm going to give you an example for thousands of years that you can't do it on your own. How hard-headed is humanity that it took them thousands of years to realize this, and there are still ones out there still thinking that they need a temple to sacrifice in. Because they don't want to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So God, yes, he expects you to do it. Why? Because we love him. But are we going to mess up? Yes. Is your child going to do everything that you want them to do? Do you have a perfect child? There's only been one perfect child born, and your name is not Jesus Christ. We shouldn't willingly sin... If 
And we should, you know, uh, we should try to get past those things that, that have been a problem for us, right? Those sins that have, what, you know, th- that seem to entangle us that we brought from our life. Here's the thing, is that when you are born again, your spirit is made alive, but your body is the same body. Did anybody get a new body when they got saved in here? No. So your body is still going to continue to sin, even though that your spirit doesn't want you to sin. If we, uh, let's, uh, let's flip over to uh, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I want to show you this. Because it's, it's, so, it's, so uh, you know, it's so important to our Christian walk that we understand this. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. This is for those that say, you know what, I'm going to continue to sin the way that God will love me more. But it says, what shall we uh, say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He is telling us right there, he says, you know what, you shouldn't want to, but the thing is that you're still going to. But that doesn't mean that you go around and be like, yeah, you know what, you know, I'm going to sin anyway, so I might as well just do it to the best of my ability. I might as well sin, you know, I might as well give everything I can to sin. No. That's what Paul is saying. That's what he's telling people, because there were Christians at this time that were doing that. They had this idea that, they were, uh, that if they sin more, that somehow God loved them more or gave them more grace. And Paul's saying, no, don't do that. You shouldn't do that. Why? Because that, you know, God hates sin. So why would you do something that God continues to hate, right? But we know that we're going to continue to sin, right? Let's look over at, uh, let's flip back a couple of pages in Romans, to Romans chapter 3, verse 20. You say, well, how do you know that, uh, that we're going to continue to sin afterwards? Well, Romans 3, 20. The Bible says, uh, it says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So in other words, he's saying, you know what? There's no law going to be, you know, nobody's going to ever be justified by, by what they do, by their deeds. And then you say, well, Pastor, what about the part, you know, of, of saying that, hey, you know what? I'm gonna, that, you know, uh, that I could be perfect. Look back at verse 10. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand. There is none that seeketh after God. So in other words, you're going to continue to sin. And you know what? Your deeds can't help you get past it. Who are you trusting in? Jesus Christ. And we see this with the the Apostle Paul. Flip over a couple uh, chapters into Romans chapter 7. The Apostle Paul Goes to, you know, was going through the same exact things that we go through every single day, and this is the Apostle Paul. Verse 14, it says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal and under sin. For that which I do, I allow, I allow not. For what I would that I, that I do not, or sorry, that I do, I, sorry, that do I not, but what I hate that I do. If then I, uh, if then I do that which I would not, I consent under the law that it is good. Now, uh, now that it is, uh, now then it is no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Verse eighteen: For I know, uh, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to uh, for to will is uh, present with me. But how to, uh, to perform the, uh, that which is good, I find not. For the good, uh, for the good that I would, I do not. But the but the evil would which I would not, that I do. If I do that which I would not, it is no more that I do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find uh, I find a law that which that when I uh, I would do good. I find then that, uh, that I, uh, I find then a law that when I would do uh, good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God, after uh, after the inward man. But I but I see another uh, law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing into captivity to the law of, of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall uh, deliver me from the 
from the death, or sorry, the body of this death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Let's go down to uh, verse, uh, let's read the next, uh, next couple of uh, verses in verse 8. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the Spirit, but, walk, uh, but after, sorry, who walk after the flesh, but not after the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of uh, for the law of the spirit of the law of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And so what we see in there, you see Paul's warring against back and forth, saying, you know what, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I do, um, you know, do not want to do, I do, and all those things going back and forth. And Paul has that thing. He says, you know what? But I'm not trusting in myself. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ, who saved me to uh, to keep me from those things, right? And so keeping the, uh, you, know, so, you know, and as I said earlier, and keep, uh, so are keeping the commandments of God required to keep your salvation in Christ? They are not required. You know why? Because you're, you know, those are two separate issues. Your salvation is dependent upon Jesus Christ. All right? You are not required as far as, you know, as far as that, you know, keeping your salvation. Why? Because your, your salvation is eternal life. It's eternal. It doesn't go away. Because you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. That's what the Bible says. We keep his commandments, his laws, his statutes, etc. because we love him and we willingly do them because we do it out of our love for him. That's the reason why we keep his commandments. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God commandeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right? We can't do it. We can't go over there and you know, sacrifice bulls and goats and everything else and get our sins forgiven. Why? Because that was just, it's not going to. The Bible says that the blood of bulls and goats are not going to do that for us. We are saved by faith alone. Nothing more, nothing less. People want to add all kinds of things to salvation. To say, you know what, this is what you have to do to be saved. And it's a flat out lie because the Bible itself says in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that is not of ourselves, but it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And you say, well, then you have other people that will come out and say over and over again, they'll say, well, you know what, Pastor? Um, repentance is not a work. Yes, it is. Have you ever tried to repent or turn away from something? Is it not work? And you say, well, well, you're just, you're, you're just, you know, uh, you're superimposing that in there. The Bible says it. Jonah chapter three verse ten says this, and God saw their works. So what are their works? He explains this as that they turned from their wicked ways, and God repented of the evil that He said that He would do unto them, and He did, uh, and He did it not. He says God saw their works. What were they doing? He says, you know what? They're evil. They're wicked. It says that they would turn away from their evil way. So what did they do? They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ back then. You say, well, how is that on Jesus Christ? Is that actually just believe on the Lord? I added the extra part. I'm sorry. But all that word repent simply means is to turn or to change. And you say, well, you know what? Repentance is repent of your sins. It is not. If you say that repentance is to turn away from your sins, then you know what? Then God is the biggest sinner of them all because you know what? God uh, repented more than anyone in the Bible. So if we're going to sit there and, and, and superimpose the fact that repentance is this, you know where, you know where that comes from? The whole to re repent of your sins thing you know, in order to get into heaven? That comes from the Mormon church. That's what they teach. They teach that you've got to repent of all your sins in order to be saved. Oh, and, and it's by, by faith alone as well. Christianity is the only religion out there that it is by faith that you are trusting in God to do everything and not you. Because every other religion requires you to do something else. They require you to repent of all your sins, to do so much good works, to do all these things in order to get into heaven. And the Bible says trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. But what about the verse, Pastor, that says, repent and believe the gospel? In Mark chapter 1, verse 15. I mean, the Bible does say repent and believe, but 
where in there does it say repent of your sins and believe? Repent, like I said, simply means to, you know, simply means to change or to turn. So in other words, when he's saying repent and believe the gospel, he's saying, you know what? Change, turn, believe Jesus. That's what it means. Simply. And everybody wants to make, you know, you know that verse say something more than it, you know, than, it actually, you know, than it actually means, which is God is saying, you know what? Change your mind, change your mind, you know, change what you're, you're trusting in and believe in him. That's what it means. If you would simply want to do that. Because this is the reason why in Acts chapter six, uh, 16, verse 30 and 31, it says, And he brought them out, and he said, Sirs, what must we do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. This is a clear cut salvation verse where he says, You know what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. So, what am I saying in this entire thing? That when we fear God, we're blessed. Plain and simple. You say, well, Pastor, you took all this time to sit there and say that you know, we're blessed. You could have just said that at the beginning. We could have been done. It could have been a short sermon, and we would have been all home right now. We need to realize that the fear of God, that the fear that we have is a, a reverence and an awe in the fact that we know that the Bible says, do not fear the one that can take your life, but fear the one that can take your life and cast it into hell, which is God. We need to realize and understand that. And we need to realize, and you say, well, Pastor, I'm still not sold on the whole fact that you say that once we have our salvation, that we can never lose our salvation, right? Well, let me see here. John 3, 16, a famous Bible verse says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him. Is that what we not just, do we not just read that in Acts chapter 16 that says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved? There's no other part in there that says, And repent of all your sins. Do you want me to read the rest of it? It says, should not perish, but have everlasting life. You've believed in them. The Bible says you have salvation, you have eternal life. And you say, well, you know what, Pastor, that's still not enough. Well, John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29 says this. It says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. These are clear-cut salvation verses, and what does he say? You can't screw it up. Because if we could mess up our salvation, we would. We would. Think about it. If we could mess it up, we would. I mean, no matter how perfect you think you are, we would mess it up. But we're not depending on ourselves. It's not about us. It's about him. And I'm thankful. I'm blessed because of that. What? Because you know what? What does it say? It says, God is going to do. He says, for God, you know, and back to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14, it says, for God shall bring every good work or every work into, uh, into judgment with every uh, secret thing, whether good, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We still need to, uh, to know that what we're doing is of the Lord. Because the Bible says that he's in no, way, uh, in no wise he's going to cast you out. We still, want to, uh, we still want to do his commandments. Why? Because we love him. Not because we're trying to get God to love us more. He already loves us as much as he's going to love us. Amen? So with that, uh, my daughter and my wife, I want us to sit there, if they would come forward, I want you, as they begin to sing the song, I want you to sit there and think about, because oftentimes we can sit there and realize that the fear of God and all this other stuff, we can get so focused on ourselves, but... What I want us to realize is how truly we, how truly blessed we truly are, amen.
the changing of leaves, food on my table, a good place to sleep, clothes on my back, and shoes on my feet, I have been Just 
So when we sit there and we read, you know, the Word of God, and we realize these things, you say, you know, we read the fear, you know, about the fear of God and all those things. We need to have that. We need to have that. We need to have that reverence and awe that God, you know, wants. And the thing is, is that when we begin to think about those ways that God has done those things in our life for us, how can we not sit there and say that we've been blessed? We just had, a, you know, the holiday, obviously, this past Thursday, about Thanksgiving and everything else. And sometimes we can get in, in, in that mode of, woe is me. We can have that attitude of, well, this doesn't work as well as it used to. I'm not able to do this because I'm not 20 years old again. Or I'm not able to do this because, you know, I'm a teenager, because, you know, I, gotta, I can't do that until I'm older. Don't focus on that. Focus on the Lord and the fact of how truly blessed you are. That's why I brought up those examples, because we, we sit there and we look at all those things, all that they went through, and all those different ones could sit there and say, you know what, woe is me. But they trusted God, and they, you know, and they believed that, you know what, that he was going to do something. And they weren't, they weren't focused on this life of saying, you know what, one day I'll, I'll, I'll get back at everybody. Their focus was, I, you know what, I have eternal life. So what does it matter what I'm going through right now? Amen?